Barry O'Reilly is a business strategist and author of the books Unlearn and Lean Enterprise. He's worked with top executives at American Airlines, Wells Fargo, and Walmart to cut through complexity and make smart decisions in a changing world. In my recent conversation with Barry, we talked about the importance of questioning assumptions and the power of incentive systems to shape behavior. Listen in. Welcome, Barry, to the Getting to Alpha podcast and the Game Thinking TV channel. Oh, here, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, Amy Jo. Thank you very much for having me. You work with senior executives and middle managers, helping them create innovative products and bring those to life in their organizations. What do you find are the problems that you most run into as you're doing it? What do you find are some of the ideas and assumptions that they need to unlearn? Thank you very much for asking that question, Amy Jo. Uh, that's very timely. This, you know, like it's been with Lean Enterprise, it just gave me this sort of phenomenal opportunity to meet leaders in companies of all shapes and sizes, like trying to do new things, you know, and uh, it's funny, the unlearn piece really came from what I, my observation was that like, while trying to teach these really gifted people, new things is hard. What was even harder was getting them to let go of their sort of existing um, behavior because most of it had made them successful to date. And when you're talking to these senior leaders about, you know, the way you're currently working is not going to help you be successful when you're trying to create new things as opposed to optimizing or scaling things, you know, sometimes they look at you like you're crazy, you know, and they're like, what, you know, what are you doing in here? I'm running this massive company. All my metrics are green. We're a growing business. Like, why do we have to change? And honestly, like 70% of the time, I just get booted out the door. You know, but um, it was sort of also a filtering mechanism for me. The leaders who were sort of like, oh, this is interesting. That's different. Well, wh why are you saying that? I think that's kind of unique, but I think that's also the type of characters you're really looking for. So many companies are, you know, they're designed to remove risk at every opportunity, big governance processes, big business cases, funding boards, committees are designed by committee, committee, committee. When you can see something as interesting, think big, but actually start small and test it, explore it, see if there is an opportunity there, like learn your way through. They're the kind of people I'm always searching for and I find I work best with. I know that you speak about incentives and you posted something to the effect of, you know, if the bonus structures aren't aligned, all the mumbo jumbo speak and telling people you want them to do stuff, they're going to ultimately do what they get bonused for. And as a game designer and a product designer, we deal in incentives all the time. And it's something that a lot of people misunderstand when they fall in love with gamification. They think external incentives, you can just kind of sprinkle them, et cetera. And incentives are complex. They're usually a combo of external and internal. So I want to understand from you how you think about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm happy to share some examples from two financial entities I work with, um, Wells Fargo and, and Capital One. Most people will probably be aware of Wells Fargo because they have had to pay the biggest corporate fine in uh, US financial history for the actually poor incentive design. So most people, I think, get trapped in this idea, and it, it goes way, way back to like the industrial era. Most incentives in companies are designed on this principal agent model. And um, it's the idea that a principal hires an agent to perform a task and they pay the agent for per performing the task. And it sort of exists everywhere from manager to employee, you know, doctor to patient. Um, you know, if you do, and it's all based on contingent relationships. If you do the work, you will get paid. Simple as that. Now, um, Wells Fargo got trapped in a classic problem that most people do uh, with incentive design is that they're not good at describing hard to measure outcomes. They wanted to sort of demonstrate how we could create a more performant business, how we could get people to like, customers were happy. What would demonstrate that we were getting more customers into our business? Very classic product manager. We want to increase our, our customers. So the way that they did that is instead of looking at a hard to measure outcome, they looked at a really easy to measure activity. They started measuring it in terms of the number of new customer accounts that were open. 
So your target was to open 100 new accounts. So initially it was great. Loads of accounts suddenly started getting opened. And then the easy picking sort of started to disappear. So what starts happening? Well, then people start finding ways to work around the system and they started opening um, fake accounts so they could hit their numbers, so they could hit their targets and get their bonuses. Um, and this sort of behavior went on and on and on and, and, until they were actually caught. And then find for this, I'll give another example then of working with Capital One. And they were a hugely outcome focused organization. And Rich Fairbank, who's the CEO and founder of the company, you know, knew that they wanted to try and digitally transform the way the business operates. Now, how many people out there are working on some sort of digital transformation initiative? And, and if you ask them, what are the measures of success for how will you know you've digitally transformed? Most people just go blank. They're like, um, we've got a mobile app. Uh, we've more customers. Uh, like they don't have good answers for this, you know? And so really what is about with the leadership is you have to start helping them describe success in changes in customer behavior that lead to a business impact. And that's hard. People aren't used to describing outcomes to know that they would have digitally transformed, never mind quantifyingly measuring them. So that's what we did. You know, got Rich to start, and the team to start thinking about different ways to describe success. And they came up, and the way to do that is you get people to tell stories. In, in two to three years' time, what would be success? if your organization had digitally transformed, and they'll start telling you. They'll start talking about the changes in behavior, like people would be using our product more, we'd increase our rate of innovation, they'd be reinvesting more of their current account back into other products and services that we had. And people would say, this is the greatest place to work. They would, you know, like they'd extend our contracts to stay longer. Like all, all the people have all these answers. And then it's really just like picking these outcomes. So Capital One went for like an increased percentage of customer reinvestment with the bank. So you want to jump it up 20% or increased rate in product innovation. So what percentage of new products would come to market and what percentage of that revenue would count for new products introduced in the last two years? Right, like really crisp definitions of what success is. When you start to think about these measures is they're not treated as targets, they're treated as directional uh, that you want to travel in. And then people are encouraged then to sort of share where they're at. And this is probably the biggest problem in corporate everywhere. Transparency is a double-edged sword. If you were in a company where your targets are tied to your uh, performance reviews and your, your wage, people get very, very worried about showing the real information. So if they're, if they're on a product and it's underperforming, they're afraid it's going to jeopardize their bonus. And in some companies, especially CEOs, like a huge percentage of their remuneration is actually bonus based, right? It's up in some instances, it's up like to 70, 80%. These are just examples of how much pressure is on executives that the bonus is all down to these sometimes performance and targets. That's actually how the market works. Bent Holstrom won the Nobel Prize for economics in 2016 for debunking how paper performance actually limits innovation in companies, not accelerates it. And yet 95% of the industry are still using paper performance as a way to manage innovation in their companies. So a lot of this stuff was actually helping leaders like recast their entire incentive systems and actually reducing the amount of financial remuneration um, tied to um, when you're designing incentives, you only need a very, very small amount of financial benefit. People are actually much more interested in job design. COVID is such a great example of this at the moment, right? Like some people value being able to work from home. Some people want to pick their kids up and drop them off. Some people will actually in value, you know, like that there's good training programs that they can develop new skills and constantly learn. Not everybody wants to get paid a 20% bonus at their salary every year. Those days are gone. You mentioned something, and I want to see if you've got any like tips and tricks for folks. It's really important when you're doing incentive design. This is a subtext of what you just said. It's very important to know your audience and know what they care about. So it's tricky sometimes designing. You you, if you just ask people what they want and you build what they want, that's bad. Like that's not actually how you design, partly because you're often building systems and systems interact. But people are just not necessarily that good at telling you. 
So have you learned any tricks along the way in your work for understanding what customers want and, you know, maybe techniques that you use or that you coach or that you've seen other people use to great effect? Yeah, I think um, one of my favorite things to do is to ask uh, disconfirming questions. Often when you ask somebody like, hey, you know, do you like listening to music? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, I love, love listening to music. It's great. I'm in out at nightclubs all the time. You know, it's great. I'm, I'm always on the dance floor because people want to tell you stories to, you know, to be liked. That's that's what people want to do. They want they, they want to tell you sometimes what you want to hear. And so often, you know, when people do that, one of the, the little questions I always like to ask there is what are some of the problems with that? Like, what are some of your struggles that happen when you're doing that? To start getting them to sort of open up more about what their problems are and go deeper into them. And and then I often hear like, oh, this is a great place to work. Everybody loves working here. And I'll be like, great. Yeah. So, you know, how many new people have you hired in the last? How many have left? And, you know, why why did they leave? It, like all these things where when people tell you a happy path, I always try to like recognize it and then start to ask questions that could disconfirm what they've just said a moment ago, because that starts surfacing more things. And then when they're like, oh, well, actually, yes, yeah, somebody had to re leave recently. I'm like, really, what happened? What, ha what happened when they had to leave? What was the what was the sort of trigger point that happened? Were you involved in that? And I think when you can get to a point where people have this like deeply emotional connection to a moment in that story and you can like hit a question there that's your gold mine right there that's where people start talking like really about the moment that they were in at the time and the, the you know the action listening for verbs like what, what were they doing what were they feeling what were they seeing and um, all these sorts of things is where i really try to get down to and people will start to give you these great narratives and i think it's just like helping guiding them to that moment of real sort of impact for them where they've been there and they've been frustrated and angry or upset or happy and like that's the nugget to try and get people there that's great bob mesta who's a jobs to be done guru and he's been on our channel recently calls that the struggling moment nice you know identify i and i've been really resonating with that concept it's so integral to the way we work as well and his insight that I thought was so valuable is, you know, there's a lot of people that will tell you a lot of things in an interview and there's people that will just complain and complain about stuff, but there's people that will tell you about their struggling moment and then what they did about it. And those people are different. Those people are the people that are going to take action. What are you seeing that's new and interesting these days in your world? What patterns. Maybe you see it in a few different conversations you have. Maybe it's a trend that you're following. Certainly COVID has impacted a lot of things, but you have a unique perspective just given who you talk to and the world you live in. What's always been interesting for me is like technology changes the constraints. It's probably some problems are the same. It opens up a different set of problems, but that's what's really interesting to me. Mental health, education, health. Like these are real problems and you know i think i hope that technology can actually open up and democratize and make it more equitable for a lot of those problems to be solved that barriers to great education at the moment is a financial constraint or you know, how, how can you change that you know if you're the best person in the world at something you should be teaching the whole world how to do that thing and technology allows that to happen i'm excited about what is going to sort of bubble up from these sort of different platforms, these tool techniques. And it's all new, like nobody knows all the answers to this stuff. And I think that's how I can help people, honestly, like in the way it shows up in, in business worlds, it's just generally senior leaders in high stakes environments, helping them collaborate and like push through and build something like that. Yeah, that's what really motivates me at the moment. I love hearing your perspective and what you do. Is there anything in particular coming up that you wanna let folks know about? And definitely let us know where we can reach you. Yeah, so I'm I'm on the internet at all good handles, barryoreilly.com. Like, so please, if you are interested in continue this conversation, just, yeah, just reach out. Like that's, I'm always looking for good signals of where I could spend more time or 
you know, find new ideas that maybe I've you've heard or connect dots from what I've shared today. Like like you've helped me uh, identify some more dots as well today. So thank you very much for that. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us at Game Thinking TV. Want more? Join me in the Game Thinking Hub, our free group for product leaders who want to innovate smarter. Go to gamethinking.io slash hub and sign up today. I'll see you there.